our faith with other people that are not able to make it to church on Sundays for whatever reason. And this is one of those added things that as we move through the world, when we have an opportunity to provide care and love for one another, we should try to do those little things, such as recording a Sunday service so we can bring it to people's homes when they can't make it here. Okay. So with that, in Matthew it is said, for where two or three are gathered in, your, in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Here we are gathered in your name. May you be in our midst as we lift up our prayers. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Dear Heavenly and Gracious God, may we lift up in prayer our many concerns and joys. May we welcome Deborah to her first time attending in a long time. We welcome you and let you know that we are always here for all of you. We pray for the AC issues and the technical side of things. As, as we troubleshoot each and every thing, we lift up these issues. We also would like to continue to pray, pray for Marjorie, for her sore throat, and that she has a, a continued healthy and, and healing recovery. We lift them up. We also pray for Estella and Lupe, as her husband Lupe is in the hospital right now. Whatever is ailing him, may you find it in your heart and, and in your being to, to help heal Lupe and be with his family. We lift him up. We pray for Brian's friend Randy, who is on the mend, and we are joyful in that healing has been occurring. We also pray for Brian's friend Trent, who is recovering from back and ankle surgery. May you be with both of them and heal them. We lift them up. We also lift up Brian and his family, whose mother had had a painful fall and that she might find healing. While also the family is finding healing and strength and peace and the adjustments that come with Alzheimer's. We lift them up. We pray for Martha Deigler and Ann and Jim Wormers as they are able to travel the world to Mongolia and to help not only spread the, the grace and love that you have, but also to inspire the, the world's love there onto them. We lift them up. We pray for Joanna Miter, where, wherever she may be, that she might find healing and comfort in the homes of the, and the people that are around them, surrounding her with love. We lift her up. We also pray for Sherilyn and Maui transitioning in their new home as they go back and forth. Make sure we keep them in our prayers that they might tra travel safely and sadly across the, the long drive. We lift them up. We also, we also lift up in prayer Deborah's brother, Lynn. May you help him find the healing that he, is, that he needs. Might you soften his heart and his soul and make him be able to listen and hear the concerns of his family and loved ones. Dear Heavenly Father, we lift them up. We also pray for the added anxiety that comes with the, the SVP hearing. Not only may you find healing for those that affected by it, but also by surrounding that community with a loving and, and healing and secure place of love. We lift them up. We pray for all those undergoing medical and, treat and, and treatments and procedures. We continue to pray for those who love, who live close to the McKinney Fire and for those emergency workers and volunteers. We also pray for the safety of the families in Ukraine. We lift them up. As we pray for all these concerns and joys, we ask that you lift up the countries observed by the World Council of Churches this week. Cameroon. Central African Republic and the Equatorial, Equatorial Guinea. We lift them up. Dear Heavenly and Gracious God, we, pre we are present in worship to lift up these concerns that your children and world may be healed. Now please join me with the Lord's Prayer. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our first scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove your evil deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. If your sins are like scarlet, will they become like snow? If they are red like crimson, will it become like wool? If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Ask Mateo, did you pick this? It's your favorite. Okay. Uh, the Gospel lesson is from 2 Timothy, verse, uh, chapter 2, 20-26. In a large house there are utensils, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for special use, some for ordinary. All who cleanse themselves of the things I have mentioned will become special utensils, dedicated and useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. Shun your youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies. You know that they bring quarrels. And, Lord's, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant that, there would, that they will repent and come to know the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please join us in the hymn of preparation in the green hymn. No, again, the words will be on the wall. Uh, fill my cup. 3093. Thank you.
morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly and Gracious God, please lift up our hearts and our souls. May we our ears be made to listen and our hearts be made to love. May you teach us how to be one with many in the world. Amen. So, does anybody recognize this symbol? Alpha and Omega. Uh, does anyone know where it comes from? Great. Great. What does it mean? First and last. The beginning and the end, yes, the first and last. What about this one? Hard to read, though. It's a little bit more complicated. We have the Alpha and Omega again. And then that symbol in the middle is the Trinity symbol. And uh, each part is the pot, patre, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then as one, and how they're interconnected, and the cross. That one got a little bit more complicated, right? Yeah. All right, what about this one? It's a little bit sim more simple. Has anyone ever seen this? The fish symbol. And we all taught in, su in Sunday school. That's how they knew that each other were Christians. One would draw a line this way, the other one would draw a line the other way to make the fish. And the other symbol in the middle, I bet you've seen that before. Do, do any of you know what it is? It is Greek. One is Christo, and the X is a cross, and then the P looking thing is called Rho in Greek. So those two letters are symbolic for Christos, the Christ. So when you see that around church, that's what that means. Christos, Christ. What about this one? Anyone seen this one before? <laughs> what is this one? The Methodist Church. Yes, the United, specifically the United Methodist Church. You know why it's called the United Methodist Church and not just the Methodist Church? Because we're all united. Yes, but originally it was a merger between two denominations, the United Brethren and the Methodists. So the way they did it was that's why there's two flanks and they're united. And the name is United Methodist Church. So that's why, because I was always confused. Why do we have a fiery cross? That sounds preposterous and obscene. But when you, it's the Pentecostal flames of two denominations going about the world on the cross. So the United Brethren and the Methodist Church came together to be one. Now, what about something more personal? What is this? Cross. A cross, a wooden cross. Why is it more personal to this church? One of the things that Marjorie and Paul, they have a, their own little ministry where they make crosses. So I know a Pastor Ye had one, and now I have one. And they also, it's a special gift that they give to the people where they hand make it and it's, it's their own ministry. So what are all these things mean? That's, that's one of the problems in church sometimes, is that we have all these different things and nobody knows what they mean. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be going over these things, like the Alpha and Omega, where it can be found in the Bible, the Bible verse specifically, uh, the, the Trinity symbols and the Christo symbols, and why are they here? Even the symbols, the Florida de Leaf, these are all different things that you see around churches all across the, the world. And we don't always understand them. The point is, is that there's a lot of hidden meaning in the things that uh, we will find in most churches. And even in each specific church, such as the wooden cross, like you see me wearing. Language also confuses people, especially when used around the church and amongst church people. Often words can feel lofty, those words can feel lofty and heavy on the tongue. But when, even when it's used correctly, can any of you name a word, a church word, that you've heard before? Eucharist. Eucharist, very good. Anyone else? If you look at the bulletin, there's some heavy words in there. The benediction, the doxology. Um, what about, you have Eucharist, but we also call it communion, right? Sacraments, 
sacrosanct, the pulpit, all these different things, a sanctuary, and uh, churches with narthexes or naves or fellowship halls, all of these different things are, are, are words that have more meaning than just the word. Now, I don't want you throwing these words around willy-nilly because someone could get hurt, right? <laughs> I'm watching you. Well, the next few sermons, we'll be exploring the different meanings of these words. And today, we'll discuss traditions, singing, and communion, or Eucharist. And which is, is, which is important since we are serving it today. Traditions. Traditions... Let's see, what, would, what, what are traditions, first of all? And why are they important? Well, to explain me, let me tell you another heavy Methodist word. And I, I emphasize the heaviness of this word. <laughs> all right? Ready? It's called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Wow, right? That's eight syllables. You guys able to handle that? <laughs> I'm handing out a pen that I have created for youth and children, but I have found that not only do the youth utilize it well, adults use it well. In fact, it's helped me find new meaning in my own faith. There's one moment. This is attached to a homework assignment, so be ready. What? <laughs> there you go. So, if you need help, maybe my wife might be able to help you. She's had to do this once or twice. <laughs> we can cheat off of her. You can maybe ask her for clar uh, clarification. All right. So if you look at it, the Wesleyan quadrilateral is a basis for growing our own foundational understanding of our faith in four ways. The quad, right? We have scripture, which is the word tradition, which is the way we worship. Reason is also logic, doesn't make logical sense. And experience, which is our personal reflection of that experience. We would expect scripture to be at the forefront, as always, because scripture is where we understand all of our traditions and our faith. But why does tradition come so heavy in the front? Why is it more important than the experience, or even logic? Well, the way I would do it is find something, a tradition, such as Eucharist or communion, or maybe acolyte, right? That's where our youth really honed in on, on it. So in acolyting, you would have our tradition. Well, where, in the, where is it talked about in the Bible? Acolyting is bringing the light into the world. Right? In that, in that tradition of having someone bring in a candle, a lit candle, to light candles in here. And we're bringing the light into church. We're bringing the light of Jesus Christ into the church. And at the end, we're taking the light of Jesus Christ out into the world. Just like the sign up front says, when you walk in from many to the one, when we walk back out, if you read the sign, it says, from the one to the many. So in that, you can say, does it make sense? Bringing light into the world. The teachings of Christ bring light to situations. Would you say that? You know, and this makes you really think about it. Does it bring it? How does it bring it? So I would even say it brings it through truth. When you bring truth as like a, a, a light, when you bring that into a situation, it helps solve problems. The experience is, how was that problem solved? So by learning so many different things, by being an acolyte myself, I know that it's in the Bible, so I can verify it. I can, I can stand on it. The yeah. next thing is, how do I practice it? Every time I light a candle, I'm bringing light into the world, and I get to experience that tradition. What does it mean in my real life situation? I know that when things don't make sense, often something's hidden. And if something's hidden, that means I need to have a light. Right? That makes it sense logically and in a personal way.
I made this to explain the connection between scripture, tradition, and reason. It's just a simple diagram of the quadrilateral. You'll see lots of them in the world. And they'll be available in order for you to discern your own personal faith on each level. Now, John Wesley, our founder of the Methodist Church, uh, he did not coin the term. In fact, uh, the person who first invented or, or coined it was Albert Adler. And he stated he regretted ever using it in the first place. But that's a whole other sermon on another day. But it came from the culmination of Wesley's work and theological understandings. Today, we, be, we will be taking communion for our Eucharist, which is one of two sacraments that we observe in the United Methodist Church. What is a sacrament? A sacrament is something that is designated for, to be overseen by people of, that are set aside. So someone that has been ordained as an elder or deacon or a licensed local pastor like myself right now. I'm in the ordination process to be an elder. But right now I am working under as a licensed local pastor, which gives me the rights to present the, the communion as an ordained individual. Different denominations, any, like the disciples, anyone can do the, uh, provide the sacraments of, of communion. And United Methodists recognize that it needs to make sure that they have a certain level of understanding and um, weight into providing these elements. Now, baptism and communion, one can only be done once, and the other is suggested as often as possible. Baptism is the United Methodist, the United Methodist Church can only happen once. And that doesn't mean that you can't have water place or, or have the same procedure done, but anytime after that first baptism, it's considered an affirmation of faith which isn't taken lightly either, but it is a different thing. We have to recognize that once someone's been baptized by the Spirit, um, to do it twice can, can feel as though, was the first time good enough then? So the first time is good enough. That's what the Methodist Church stands on. Any, effort, any time after that, it is just an affirmation that you still believe and that you recognize that you've been baptized and you want to make it known to the world that you want to be affirmed with you. Communion or Eucharist is suggested to occur as much as needed. The elements are usually bread and grape juice in the United Methodist Church. Does anybody know uh, where the grape juice started coming around? Welch's. Welch's? Well, he's the Methodist. Yeah, Dr. Welch. <laughs> Sounds familiar? <laughs> Dr. Welch, but in 1869, was a Methodist minister who created non-alcoholic wine. That's why we are able to use non-alcoholic wine in Methodist churches. What's another reason why Methodists might be involved in non-alcoholic things? Prohibition? United Methodist women, very strong fervency, uh, was also one of the driving forces behind Prohibition early on. Some of the, these elements have more important have more, um, don't have the appropriate level of cultural and environmental uh, weight in different parts of the world. In some Pacific Islands, you don't find wheat. So when you bring bread to a communion table in the islands, they understand it as being holy and set aside, but they don't normally have bread. They have taro, they have coconut, and the most important, uh, life-giving thing that they have is a coconut. So the coconut provides meat on the inside and a liquid. And these provide a lot of life. So when you take a coconut and you observe communion through um, a coconut, it has more power in that community than grape juice and bread. Because grape juice and bread aren't normally there. So as you can see, different things can be used. Um, depending on the culture. Um, even in the Jewish traditions, there, some of it might be unleavened bread, or you might have pita bread. They don't all have to be the same because different places in the world have different emphasis or different resources available. So it's 
important to recognize these. But what do both have in common? Cleaning in progress. In the scriptures today, the idea is of being clean or washed away our sins and wrongdoings as something that is sometimes difficult to admit, let alone believe. But it is true. The Old Testament and the New Testament both attest to this. And it is simple and confiding in Jesus Christ. On the cross, there are two other people being condemned to death, crucified. One mocked Jesus, and the other believed. And when he told Jesus that he believed, Jesus had responded to him, saying that he would be forgiven, and he would be sat at the table next to Jesus Christ. Did he have to go to a confirmation class? Did he have to have a baptism? Jesus said right there that you are forgiven and you will come with me. Just for believing. And that's a powerful solvent. Sometimes in life, our habitat or environment becomes toxic or intolerable. A small tree, tree out front had cracked and had fallen over across the roadway. But just like that, just like us, it doesn't mean the end. As good stewards, as good neighbors, and as Christians, we are called to gather our tools, to be ready for special use, to help make clean and make room for life to grow. So, over the last couple days, I pulled out my tools. I started cutting and sawing. I didn't have a chainsaw. I had to do it the old school way. I got a nice good rope, and I would tie the strings and drag them to the back. This was a long and arduous process, and I thought about hooking them up to my car. <laughs> but it was very symbolic. Each time I cut one of those branches down, and I started dragging it back, I started thinking about the scriptures from last week. Uh, from our Bible study, actually. It was in Genesis and about another creation and how after the first sin, that man was made to toil and have the sweat of his brow. And guess where I was walking towards? When I was, as I was carrying, I had, literally had a rope wrapped around my chest and I was pulling it forward. I was walking right towards that cross. And it brought me back home. It brought me back to when I first came back to Christ. How badly I wanted it. How badly I was tired of being out there alone, of being scared of running, not knowing what I was gonna do next. But when I got to work, and I drove towards that cross, this broken, mangled mess, of something that has life and had life doesn't have to be the end. That day, I took that other picture right over the mountains. And I was tired and I was sweaty. But I looked up there and I saw that light just shining right down. And it actually lit up that whole valley. There was a, George had pointed it out once to me. There's this like, almost like a riverbed rock coming, almost like the mountains were crying. And it reminded me of the beauty of once it's all done, it's done. That something can be ready for special use. Are you ready for special use? In 2 Timothy, it talks about being uh, any ordinary use. I, I shared with her, I'm going to move off of this because there's something, this is personal to me, especially after what was shared about Deborah's brother. I'm a recovered alcoholic, working a program of recovery. And with all my heart and soul, I, my heart goes out to your brother. It's hard. It's really hard. Every day you have to step into a life knowing that your old life 
has to go away. And where I first read this scripture of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22, was in a Gideon's Bible when I was in jail. I was scared. I was alone. I needed help. I opened up that Bible, and in it it said, prayer for addiction or alcoholism. There it was. Shun, shun youthful passions, seek righteousness, love, peace. Right there I knew. I knew what it meant. It meant I'm going to dive deeper into the Bible than I ever had before. And it was important. This was my life on the line. And while I was there, it gave me an opportunity to really get to know myself again. To recognize that Mateo, as a kid, I was known as Matt or Matthew. I got to meet Matt and Matthew. And I had to tell them I'm sorry for all that I've done. And I met Jesus Christ there. Jesus Christ told me, it is done. So each step of the way, now I didn't think I was going to come back to be a pastor. I had a calling when I was in high school. I didn't think this was in, in any kind of work going to happen. But as I kept doing the work, as the brow, as the sweat from my brow, and the, I did the honest work, and I kept walking towards that cross, I found that my calling was still burning and raging inside of me. It just had been covered up with stuff. I was trying to cover it up. My calling to be a pastor was still there and as strong as ever. I tell you this now. When someone is out there in the world lost, make sure you are a beacon to shine your light out so that if they need the help and are willing to come to it, they know where that beacon is. So now that I completely moved off my sermon, <laughs> let's talk about the hymnal. Go ahead and open up your hymnal. How many of you have ever read the hymnal before? There's a subsection in there, section seven. It's a little, little B and two little I's. So it's right in the front. So there is actually directions for singing. Did you know that? Ten directions. And when I read that, I realized when I was in seminary, like, oh, no, this means I actually have to sing. But it says not to be too loud or boastful. So I'm like, okay. And to make sure I don't overtake the song. So at least I can sit in that. But when we hear the songs and the hymnals, sing them. Sing them with each other. Sing them at home. Sometimes if you ever come by the office, you hear music playing. Often, it's either a soundtrack from Hamilton. It really is my juice is going. <laughs> or it's Hamilton. Or it's uh, the hymnal. I have the hymnal playing in my office over here. But it really restores my soul as I move throughout the day. So, did any of you ever know that there was a direction for singing? <laughs> All right. Well, John Wesley's brother, Charles, was a prolific hymnist. He wrote over 6,000 hymns. 6,000 hymns, right? His own, uh, John Wesley's own faith was stirred by a group of Merovingians who sung during a terrible storm because of their security and faith, that while everyone was in chaos, they sung their hymns and were able to stay calm. So when we think about this, music has a way of bringing a special element of, of church to our lives. That our preludes and postludes offer our time to reflect before and after service. Today's postlude is Out Fly Away. And I will have the lyrics up here on the screen today if you, or if you would like to sing after we do our song together. And Barbara will be providing the music. But it is a very joyful and renewing song. So make that joyful noise. You guys have your homework. You have your sheet. So remember, when you go home, think of a tradition in the church, any church. Maybe you grew up in a Catholic church, Presbyterian, or Lutheran church. 
Think of a tradition you would do in that church. Then try to find the scripture that helped back that tradition. And then fill it out on all, how it means to you personally. For me, it's of the special utensils and communion. And next week, we will talk about robes, stoles, alps, cossacks, and more. Come back next week to hear what we wear and where we wear. Is that good for you, Brian? I think you mean why we wear and where we wear. Why we wear and where we wear. Do you understand where? Look at here, and I'll be wary. Okay. If you live locally here in Borrego Springs, another thing I'd like to iterate is that we will be able, I hope, to bring communion to those who are unable to make it here in church. So if any of you know anyone that would like to have communion but aren't able to come in person, Tell them to call the office or contact me, and we'll arrange to bring communion to them. Okay? All right. Please rise as we say the response. As we talk about sanitization and healing, I must do my best to sanitize myself before presenting the help. Christ our Lord invites us to this table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with all our own heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. 
Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us in the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. All glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Thank you. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name. Join me. Their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, both now and the highest. Blessed are those in heaven in the name of the Lord, both now and the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. In the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the self of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of those of these your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as holy and living sacrifice. In union with Christ's offering for us, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be, for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and the ministry, and one ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Abba, now and forever. Amen. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Abba, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Body of Christ, broken for you. The blood of Christ, given for you.
Please come forward so that you're able. That's good. Whether we are here in person, the joy basket and donations, or by mail, as soon we will have an e-giving available online as well. We give thanks to you, all of you, for your support and ties to the offering and support of continuing the ministry here at Marengo Springs Community United Methodist Church. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
with the blessings of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and God. May we walk into this week with that peace. Amen. Amen.